That was a great way to start a Wednesday night. Amen. And also this morning, we started with a baptism as well. Young lady uh, by name of Jewel. Uh, she decided one day that she was going to change the kind of music that she was listening to. And while on Spotify, who has Spotify in here? Okay, younger generation, we have Spotify. Uh, it's not food, it's... it's a... <laughs> Anyways, while she was on Spotify, uh, she decided, you know, I'm going to look for a Christian podcast. And uh, she said she is, she is not... She doesn't listen to podcasts. She doesn't do podcasts, but for some reason, she decided to do that. Now, if you type, if you have Spotify and you type in Christian podcast, there's a hundreds, you know, there's hundreds of them on Spotify. But as she scrolled through these different podcasts, she saw the Authentic Christian Podcast. And that podcast is run by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, GBN. And so when she was telling me this story, I was like, wow. Of all the podcasts you found, the podcast sponsored by the Lord's Church, one of the po podcasts, Gospel Broadcasting Network, they do a lot of media evangelism. The podcast is one of them. And so she listened to the podcast, and then she reached out to one of the, you know, the people on the panel. You have Aaron, Justin, and, uh, and Scott. I graduated with Scott. But she reached out to Aaron, and Aaron uh, studied with her. And so... She lives here, grew up in Hawaii, but someone from Tennessee was studying with her, all right, on the phone. And she learned the gospel. She learned that she wanted to obey the gospel. And this morning, I woke up to a call from Aaron saying that she was ready to be baptized. And um, we went to Almoana. Uh, Auntie and uh, um, Auntie Bernice and Uncle Yona were with me, and we baptized her into Christ. And then, of course, we went to Liliha Bakery. Last week, Sunday, at the close of the morning service, Nainoa saw a question by Kalani. Kalani asked a question. When do we do baptisms? That was the question. And I thank God I know came and caught me after the service and pointed that question out. And so I asked Bernice to follow up with Carrie Lynn. Carrie Lynn had mentioned Friday night. Friday night at the singing, we met Kalani and his wife, Jackie. I remember your name. Uh, and his wife, Jackie, at Friday nights. And Friday night, we were introduced and Carrie Lynn had thought about studying with him, about, you know, obeying the gospel. And so today, it just so happened that today, Auntie gave me the update that Kalani still wants to be baptized. And so that's why our service was sort of delayed in start today. Kalani, um, uh, after we study Acts chapter 2, now we just looked at Acts chapter 2. We looked at the sermon that Peter preached, and in that sermon, I highlighted for him that, that Jesus died and was buried and resurrected again, and because of that, we have the hope of eternal life, that through Christ, we overcome the fear of death, because death comes upon us all, and because of his death, fear, and resurrection, mankind has hope after death, and so... When he learned that it was in Romans chapter 6, we read together when he learned that it is through baptism that you join Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, I, was, I was willing to say to Kalani, Kalani, let's meet again 
um, and let's study more about this. But at the same time, I knew he had a desire to obey the gospel. And so I asked him again, do you still want to be baptized? And he said, yes. So I'm not going to stop him from doing this, right? There's so much more learning to do, but when someone is ready to be baptized, they're ready to be baptized. They can learn more after. And that's the motto that Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teach them. All right? So you have preaching of the gospel, baptize those who believe. And then he says, teach them to observe all things. Whatever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, praise God, Talani, for your heart and your decision to obey the gospel. Uh, your church family is here for you, and uh, uh, we're here to help, right? We're here to help each other uh, make it together in heaven. So, I just can't think of a better Wednesday night, you know? Uh, um Today is a glorious day, and as Aaron prayed, that the heavens are rejoicing with us, that two souls came to Christ today, and all glory and praise to our Father in heaven. Announcements. The last announcement is uh, there in the back. We have a box for snacks for Kaimana and Brian. They're going to college. Uh, if you would like to, you know, donate a snack for them. Uh, if you need more information, ask Lala. Uh, she is putting these packages together. So appreciate Lala for doing that. And so let's tra transition right into our Bible class. All right. Can someone turn this screen on? The, the remote. So there's a TV remote in the back. No. Thank you. I think I know us very busy today so we're definitely missing him it's the one with with lesser buttons anyways we continue our study of of oh no the black one is the samsung remote thank you so we continue our study of canonization, and not too long ago, uh, because there was a gap in, in our study, uh, we talked about the development of writing. And that's really where I want us to pick off, uh, pick up off, or to start back up, uh, is with the development of writing. Because before you collect the scriptures and make the canon, or not make the canon, but determine the canon of scriptures, or understand the authority of the scriptures, before the writings are collected, we have to look at the development of writing, right? How did writing come about? Because God was patient. Uh, think about Galatians 4 and verse 4, that Jesus did not come in the time where Jesus was not born in a time when writing wasn't around, right? Because it would be difficult. Uh, um, I could imagine there will be some challenges in, in, in preserving books that were written. Um, go with me to Galatians 4 and verse 4. I'd like to read that for us because I want to highlight this important fact that God waited before any scripture was written, beginning from Moses, that God waited till a time that writing was developed in order to bring about his word. In Galatians 4, and verse 4, if I can find Galatians 4, and verse 4, <clears throat> but when the fullness of time had come, right, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. A short statement, but a very important statement in scriptures, a very important statement about the providence of God, how God works and how he worked throughout history 
uh, to bring about salvation in Christ, right? And so Jesus was not born under the time when the Greeks were ruling the world. He was not born when the Babylonians took Israel to captive away from the land of promise where the promise would be fulfilled in the land of promise, right? But this passage tells us that God in his timing, right? Um, God waited until everything was right for Jesus to enter the world, right? Think about the time when the Romans were in power. Anyone here know one of the major contributions the Romans uh, gave for the spreading of the gospel? The roads. A lot of the roads that Paul traveled to preach the gospel did not exist in the times of the Babylonians. Some of them were. But a lot of the routes that were there in the first century around the time was that Jesus was born, the Roman Empire paved those roads. And so God did not ignore history, right? He was, he was always in control. He did not ignore the development of mankind, uh, uh, but he used it to bring about his will, right? So in other words, God did not skip any steps. He was patient. He allowed mankind to develop things to develop for the for the uh, spreading of the good news. And I mentioned last week, imagine, or the week prior to, imagine if the Bible was written during the times of pictograms and lullabies, right? In those times, th there were some signs stood for the same thing. And so imagine trying to understand the meaning of scripture when there was no system that is precise, a system that we could easily decipher and understand his will. And so God did not ignore history. So I want to show you uh, this video. I thought it was a fun video. I went and looked up multiple ones, but I decided to show you this one just so, again, we can appreciate the development of writing because it has everything to do with the canon of scriptures. On this show, we often talk about the history of people or places, societies. Rarely do we get to talk about the history of an idea. So today we're going to try an experiment. We're going to talk about the history of the concept of the written word. Writing is one of mankind's most enduring technologies. For 5,600 years, this ability to transmit thoughts over generations, to give instructions, to express ourselves, to communicate ideas over the gulf of space and time, has allowed us to make vast strides in our understanding of the universe, our understanding of each other, and our understanding of ourselves. But to understand how writing began, we have to travel back to ancient Sumer, where the first widespread use of writing started. Look around, what do you see? Yes, you see the potters and the merchants, you see streets and gardens, but what do you see looming over all of it? The temples. These temples play a huge part in why writing began. For, you see, Sumer was the land of the world's first real cities. Not hundreds of people, or thousands of people, but tens of thousands grouped together. And these cities formed city-states, bound together by the veneration of a specific set of gods. The people mastered irrigation, and the cities grew. And as the cities grew, so too did the temples to the gods. But these massive, sprawling temple complexes didn't serve only as houses of worship. No, no, look close. Do you see the men bringing in the clay pitchers full of grain? These temples also served as enormous warehouses, repositories for the vast wealth of the city. In good times, donations and gifts would come flooding in. And in lean times, they would be distributed back out. This system created vast wealth for the priests, but it also ensured that cities of this size could function. But we're not concerned with that, not directly. Look next to the men bringing in the grain. Do you see that man watching them? Notice how every time they bring in a jar of grain, he makes a little mark on that clay tablet he's holding. With an economy of this size, with tons of supplies moving in and out of the temple each day, they needed to keep records somehow, and that is exactly what he's doing. 
That tablet will later be stored so that priests can know what exactly they have on hand in their giant temple warehouse. But as much as tally marks have their place in the origin of writing, there's something far more interesting for us on that wet piece of clay he's got in his hands. You see, he's drawn a little picture of a grain stalk next to his tally marks, so it's clear that his tallies refer to grain. Well, over the generations, that nice little drawing of grain would get simpler, more abstracted. Scribes looking for quicker and easier ways to note common goods wouldn't laboriously draw every single item coming into the temple, but instead came to an agreed-upon set of more symbolic representations for the goods flowing into the holy places. And you can see how somebody might quickly realize that those symbols could represent not only the concept of something, but the word itself. And that's exactly what happened. The symbol for a cow came to be understood not only as a representative of the animal, but also of the word cow itself. But still, there's not much you can do with just a set of a thousand or so nouns. And here's where a happy accident of linguistics comes in. You see the people talking around the temple? Well, if you could hear them, it would sound like everybody was just saying the same few words over and over again. And that's because Sumerian is a language where most of the words are just single syllables, and where concepts are built out of putting words together. Both of those points are important, because when many of your words are monosyllables, it's easy to go from thinking of a symbol as a word to thinking of it as a sound for that word. To go from thinking of the symbol for the you, meaning just the sheep, to thinking of it as meaning the sound you, and thus giving you the word for the tree you, or the person you. Once you do this, you're no longer drawing pictures for every word in the language. Now you're starting to think of those pictures as sounds, and stringing sounds together lets you build up all sorts of words. And once you couple that with the fact that in Sumerian, many concepts were built up out of basic words, so for example, sickle plus grain might mean harvest, there's a huge amount you can do with the concepts and sounds that a thousand or so images represent. But we're not done yet, because the very medium the scribes were writing on changed how we write in the West today. You remember how our buddy in the temple tallying the grain was making his marks on a clay tablet? Well, watch him write. See how he's writing from top to bottom, just as you would if you were making a list. Well, that would soon change, because the problem with clay is that it takes forever to dry. And so if you accidentally set your hand down while you're writing from top to bottom, you could easily obliterate whole sections of the column you just wrote. But this risk is reduced if you start writing from left to right. But a lot of the people in the temple didn't like that innovation. It was easier on the scribes, but for the other literate folks who had to read it, they had learned to read from top to bottom, and so they didn't like this sideways thing at all. So what did the scribes do? Well, they simply rotated all of the characters 90 degrees so that a person could turn the tablet and read it from top to bottom just like they always had. Soon, people were just reading the sideways characters left to right. But because they'd been flipped, now they were even more abstracted, even further from the pictures and the things that they originally represented. This writing system was then adopted by the neighboring Akkadians and Elamites, who abstracted it even further. Determinatives, or little markers to designate what part of speech something was in case it was ambiguous, also got added. And now you've got a real writing system. The original pictures, and even the pictograms they became, vanished entirely into wedge-shaped impressions and line strokes made by the stylus favored at the time. Which means, instead of simply a handful of nouns to record storage lists, we have a system for writing that can give us things as abstract and lyrical as the Epic of Gilgamesh, or the Enuma Elish. So how do we know all this? Well, funny thing about clay, when a place is burned down and all of your writing is on clay, rather than it being destroyed, the writing hardens and becomes preserved. But that won't happen here for some time, so let's just celebrate what scribes like this one and the marvelous city of Sumer gave us. A gift that has lasted us more than five and a half thousand years. Writing. Now, since we don't get to do the lies episodes for these one-offs, I also want to point out that this is just the first place in history where writing achieved widespread use. Later, it would be developed independently in Mesoamerica, and was almost certainly developed independently in China. There's a great deal of contention about whether it developed independently in the Indus Valley and Egypt, although from what we've read, which admittedly isn't nearly enough to form anything more than a layman's opinion, I'm more in the camp that both of these groups inherited the basic concept from Sumer. Anyway, let us know in the comments if you liked this little experiment and are as interested in the history of ideas as the history of societies and peoples. If so, we'll try to do this from time to time. Who knows, maybe we'll even cover how we moved from the Sumerians writing syllables to that incredible tool, the alphabet, that most Western cultures still use today. See you next week. I figured that that voice would keep you attentive. <laughs> so that's why I chose that video, but there's a lot of uh, good uh, 
facts that they stated there for us. Uh, but again, what we covered before, how writing developed from uh, Paul Wagner's book, uh, went from drawings, pictograms, logograms, syllabic writing, and then you have the alphabet. And so again, Galatians 4.4 4 in principle, God waited uh, before, you know, bringing about his people, creating his people in Egypt. Um, God waited till writing was available in order to communicate, use it to communicate his will uh, to mankind. And so now I want us to transition to the languages of the Bible. All right, now we have writing. Let's, let's read up a, a little bit about the three languages of the Bible. You have the Hebrew, Aramaic, and the Greek. All right, so again, these um, thoughts I'm sharing with you all come from uh, Paul D. Wagner's book, The Journey from Text to Translations. And so, and I quote, the majority of the Old Testament was written in what is commonly known as classical Hebrew or biblical Hebrew as, dis as distinct from latter forms of this language, such as the rabbinic Hebrew, Hebrew, and the medieval Hebrew, and modern Hebrew. It is difficult to know just how long classical Hebrew was a spoken language. For the earliest extant texts come from about the 12th and 10th centuries BC. Hebrew experienced fairly wide usage during the 8th century BC. Isaiah calls it the language of Canaan. He gives a verse there. Isaiah 19, verse 18. And even older documents written in the Phoenician language are very similar. During the biblical period, two different scripts were used for Hebrew. The earlier called Paleo-Hebrew, or Old Hebrew, and the latter square script, or Assyrian script, after its ori origin. See table 6-1. So this is table 6-1. So you have there on one side, you have the Paleo Hebrew and then square script Hebrew. Um, if you open your Bibles to Psalm 119, you will notice that the Hebrew that the scribes use, the form is the square script Hebrew, not the, um, the, the older version. And if you see that in your Bible, in Psalm 119, the way those are written, the letters, um, they're written in the square script uh, form of writing. Continuing on in the quote, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, the order of which is found in several alphabetic acrostics in the book of Psalms. And he gives you several references. I mentioned this in our study of Psalm 119 which is still ongoing, that there are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 sections in that psalm, Psalm 119, 22 sections, eight verse in each section. The first letter in those eight verses begins with the, the letter of the Hebrew alphabet that characterized that section. So let's take, for example, Psalm 119, verse one through eight, all begin with the letter Aleph. And then Psalm 119, verse 9 through 17, 16, 16, thank you, Zachary, to 16 um, is all the, the uh, second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then you just continue on, uh, so on and so forth. Originally, the Old Testament was not written with vowel points because the points were not needed. But as the Jews began to rely on Aramaic as their spoken language, Hebrew became more and more neglected. During the Babylonian exile, the, the conversion from Hebrew to Aramaic as the common language accelerated, so much so that the Amaya was incensed to find that few people could speak or read Hebrew after their return from the exile. Uh, I want to pause here in the quote. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. We see that evident in Nehemiah chapter 8, the time when Ezra the scribe 
was called to read the word of God in front of the people of God in the square. Go there with me, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. Verse 3, beginning in verse 3, all right? Then he read from it in the open square, he's reading the word of God, that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand, the ears and, and the ears of all the people who were attentive to the book, were attentive to the book of law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him at his right hand, stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Urijah, Hilkiah, Masaiah, and his left uh, hand stood Pedadiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashpadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And in verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, then all the people answered, Amen, Amen while lifting up their hands. And they bow their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Skip down to uh, verse 8. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them understand the read. Why were the Hebrews helped in order to understand their own language, the reading of their own language? It was because when they were in captivity, a lot of them spoke uh, uh, did not understand Hebrew. And so they, the priest and Ezra and several others had to explain and translate to them what, just, what he just read uh, from the, uh, the Hebrew language. Continuing the quote, going back to the quote, it was considered, uh, after the uh, Nehemiah 13, 24 reference, it was considered the sacred language. However, well, the sacred language, however, and was kept alive by the rabbis. Eventually, the Masoretes, scribes who helped preserve the Hebrew text from about 500 to 1,000, added vowel points to the text between the 5th to the 8th centuries in order to assist pronunciation. Jesus was clearly aware that the Old Testament was written in the Hebrew square script when he said in Matthew 5:18. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not one iota or one tittle will by no means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So again, uh, highlighting that, it, that the writings that Jesus quoted from and was there in the days of Jesus was not written in the in paleo Hebrew script. It was written in the square script. Uh, as we have it in our Bibles, illustrated there in Psalm 119. Continuing the quote from uh, Wagner, Hebrew letters also signify numbers and at times may have been used as mnemonic devices to aid in remembering scripture. For example, Matthew 1, verse 1 through 17, makes it clear that Jesus was in the Davidic line and that there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, from David to the deportation to Babylon, and from Babylonian deportation to Jesus. When they are added up, the numbers of the name David equal 14. I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and so that's what it would look like. The letters that would spell the name of David would add up to 14, you know, 14, number 14. Matthew uses that and, and emphasizes that in, in giving the line of Jesus from Abraham to David, 14, David to Babylonian captivity, 14, from Babylonian captivity to Jesus, 14 generations. Um, and so that's, that's the major language of the Old Testament. The Bible was written in Hebrew, uh, in square script, uh, as... as um, as we already discussed, the second language is that of Aramaic. And we already referenced during the Babylonian captivity, that's when Aramaic uh, was accelerated among the Hebrews. Um, Ren? Yeah. 
Yes. So, um, uh, Ran asked, is it true that the Hebrew is read from right to left? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the case. Um, there's actually some interesting things about the Greek language, too, because Greek kind of started a, a, um, in that same pattern throughout writing. They, they started from right to left, and then they alternated it, and then they decided to just go from left to right. Uh, it's, it's interesting stuff. Um, anyone else want to comment on that? Or any other thoughts or comments? Pat? So for those online, uh, Pat asked a question about the age of the earth and how, you know, there's, there's uh, in the accepted worldview, I'm talking about the worldview where there's no God, uh, the accepted worldview teaches that the age of the earth is some millions years old. I don't know the exact number now. It sort of evolved throughout time, but evolution would say the Earth is millions and millions of years old, right? If not billions, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, but then you have the biblical worldview that shows that the world is somewhere around six thousand years old. Uh, sometimes, some some who are creationists would say ten thousand years old, right? a major difference from millions of years old. And so how old is the earth? The, those who are creationists who follow the Bible, the estimations of 6,000, um, of about 6,000 is based on counting the generations and the different events that the Bible records, right? And so again, someone who may not believe the Bible is the word of God, will look at that and laugh about it. But, but we have here history book, right? A true history book that records history accurately, the history of mankind, the Amidus, and so on and so forth. I don't know the exact age. Maybe that was a question for Dr. Brad Hare. Um, but... I believe, based on evidence that I've read, it's not millions of years old, especially um, recent discoveries, and we'll close with that, Re recent discoveries in paleontology. Uh, you have, uh, not too long ago, a scientist, a paleontologist named uh, Mark Armitage. This man was fired from the, uh, I think it's the University of California, UCLA, I think he was fired from their science department. He had worked there for years, but he was fired from his science department because of his analysis of a dinosaur fossil that was discovered. So they discovered a dinosaur bone with tissue still on the bone, right? And so they tested the tissue multiple times. And he's not the first one. A woman before him, maybe five or 10 years before him, made the same discovery, but she was sort of like silenced by, you know, the science bullies. Anyways, but um, Mark Armitage, he refused to be silenced because his discovery, he, he, he tested the tissue and it came out to be a form of protein. Um, I think it's collagen is the protein. And scientific estimation, that protein um, doesn't last that long, all right? Uh, I think the estimation, on it could last up to a, a 900,000 plus years in special conditions. Now, that discovery undermines the billions of years that the evolution says, right? Because you have a dinosaur bone with flesh still on it. So Mark Armitage had to make a decision, keep his job or follow the science. And he followed the science. He was fired for it, right? And so there are evidence like that. There are many more that have been discovered that showed dinosaurs existed not too long ago. 
not not 60 million years ago, uh, but just as the Bible teaches, man and dinosaur lived together, right? Uh, before we close in a prayer, la last night I watched that movie Noah with uh, who's the guy from Gladiator? Russell Crowe. So I thought that movie has been out. I've heard some bad things about it, how inaccurate it is. And so finally last night I watched it and it's completely inaccurate. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to watch it. I would not recommend watching it. Uh, it's, it's not a good, it's not biblically accurate. Uh, there were some scenes that my kids said that that's not right. That's not what the Bible says, right? Uh, and so kids can, know, when kids know their Bible, they know their Bible. This was, this was a gap theory approach. Uh, those who are theistic evolutionists are involved in the movie of Noah. And they're trying to harmonize evolution and the biblical account. And so, yeah, that's, yeah. Anyways, I went there. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We praise you for the two souls that obey the gospel to today, Lord. Thank you for their tender hearts. Thank you for those involved in their lives that help lead them to Christ, Lord. And thank you for your word that teaches us your will. And so help us to understand the things that we are doing in order to please you. And so, Father, we thank you for being your children, for the privilege of being called your children. And help us, Father, to be the light in this world. Help us to continue to reach out to lost souls. Help us to also encourage one another to help keep the saved saved and help reach those who are lost. Father, please continue to bless our efforts as a church to do your will. We love you and we want to obey your will. Please keep us safe as we part tonight. We thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It is through his name we pray. Amen.